There's one name that's not on my slides that I'm like suddenly mm -hmm. losing. I don't remember. Okay. I look okay. Up. Okay. Reception here is that. Um. Okay, so maybe we'll start. Shall we, Shall we start? Ah, oh, yeah, you can start. Hello. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome you all uh, to this evening's lecture. Uh, my name is Eleni O'Neill, and I am the chair of the math department here at Stanford. This lecture is one in a series of public lectures that is organized by the uh, Stanford Mathematics Department um, and is sponsored by the Stanford Mathematics Research Center and the Friends of Stanford Mathematics. And if you would like to be notified of events like this and you are not on our waiting list, uh, on our mailing list, please uh, send me an email at chair at mass.stanford.edu. This evening we are very fortunate to have as our speaker Professor Jordan Ellenberg. Before we begin, I would like to keep, tell you a couple of uh, things about uh, our speaker this evening. Professor Ellenberg grew up in Potomac, Maryland. A son of two statisticians, he got interested in mathematics at a young age. He went on to Harvard for college, uh, where he got a degree in mathematics in 1993. Then he got a master's in fiction writing from John Hop Hopkins. Hmm? Well, it is, in my opinion. And then he returned to Harvard to get a PhD in mathematics in 1998, under the guidance of Professor Barry Mazur. After spending a few years at Princeton as a postdoc, he joined the faculty of University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2004, where he is now the John D. MacArthur Professor of Mathematics. Professor Ellenberg won several awards and honors. Let me just mention a few here. In 2001, he won the Young Investigator Award from NSA. In 2005, he got the Sloan Fellowship and also the Career Award from the National Science Foundation. In 2012, he was part of the inaugural class uh, of the Fellows of the American Mathematical Society. And just recently, in 2015, he became a Guggenheim Fellow. Professor Ellenberg's research is centered around number theory and arithmetic al algebraic geometry, and more broadly across several other areas of mathematics on the more algebraic side. It also includes work on a variety of counting problems in number theory using symmetries and ideas from topology, and also part of a long-term collaboration with two of our colleagues here at Stanford, in the Stanford Math Department, Professor Akshay Bevenkatesh and Tom Church. Just earlier this year, Professor Ellenberg made a breakthrough in combinatorics with his solution to a pattern matching question called the CAPSET problem, which was featured in May issues of Quanta magazine. In addition to his research, Professor Ellenberg has been writing numerous expository articles on mathematical topics for a variety of publications, including the New York Times, Slate, the Wall Street Journal, Wired, and the Washington Post. He's also the author of two books. The first one, a novel, The Grasshopper King, was published in 2003, and a more recently, the book How Not to Be Wrong, The Power of Mathematical Thinking, that was published in 2014 which was on the New York Times and the Sunday Times bestseller and a winner of the 2016 Euler Book Prize Award. So we are really delighted to have Jordan tonight speak about how to use math to get rich in the lottery. I should say there is a catch that 
most likely this will not help you get rich <laughs> in the lottery. But instead, Jordan will use this topic as an excuse to take us on a tour of some interesting mathematics. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ellenberg tonight. Well, thank you guys so much. I'm just checking everyone's still here after Eleni revealed that I'm not going to tell you all how to get rich. OK. Um, I, it's always a great pleasure to be here and that amidst the incredible mathematical atmosphere of Stanford. I should say I have been doing math with these people nonstop since like 9 o'clock this morning. So, um, But I think I still have like this much energy left to like tell you all uh, this story because you know, telling stories about math is like really what I do in this book and like what I do uh, when I'm writing articles in the newspaper on mathematical topics. Um, so let me tell you a story about lotteries. So what you're looking at here uh, is a drawing uh, from the Massachusetts State Lottery, um, a game called Cash Windfall. Um, actually, for reasons I don't fully understand, um, you can go to YouTube and see a record of every single drawing that was ever held. <laughs> Uh, in this game. Um, what you are looking at, although to be honest it looks like all the others, uh, is a picture of the last ever drawing of Cash Windfall. Uh, and the point of this story is to explain why it was the last ever drawing of Cash Windfall. So in order to explain that, I've got to start by telling you a little bit about how lotteries work, which maybe some of you know, but maybe it will be a review. Um, so first of all, you know, in math, if there's something that's kind of complicated like a lottery, we like to make it simpler to explain it. So let's here uh, discuss a version of the lottery where, well, let's start with something realistic. Tickets cost $2, which is about how much a real lottery ticket usually costs. Um, but here, let's not have this kind of complicated structure. Let's just say there's one big prize, uh, the jackpot, which is $300, and one in every 200 tickets is going to win. So when we think about playing the lottery, we usually think about it sort of in the long term. We say, what happens if you play the lottery a lot? And people who play the lottery, by the way, do play the lottery a lot. So this is not an unrealistic assumption. We say, what if you play this lottery a thousand times? Well, if you win one, if one out of every 200 tickets is a winner, you'll probably win about five times. And so in all, uh, you're going to come away with $1,500 or $1.50 per ticket. Which sounds, I mean, that sounds pretty good. Like $1,500 is not a trivial amount of money. Um, until you remember that you actually spent $2,000 in order to get those 1,000 tickets uh, to win that $1,500. In some sense, now you already understand what lotteries are about. Um, let, me, let me just sort of start by telling you about the piece of mathematical terminology we use to describe this. I'm going to introduce it only in order to criticize it. Um, so usually what we would say is that the expected value of the ticket is $1.50. If you remember, that was, like, that was like how much per ticket you were likely going to win. And this is one of those mathematical terms that you know, everybody kind of wishes we could go back in history and take it back and change it and call it something else. Because after all, this expected value, one thing it is definitely not is the value you expect the ticket to have. It, it's exactly the opposite. It's like literally a value that the ticket cannot possibly have. The ticket is either worth nothing or it's worth $200. It's definitely not worth a buck fifty. And yet we call a dollar fifty the expected value. So maybe a better name, if we could go back in time and change it, would be something more like the average value, because that's really what it represents, and that's somehow the first step in our analysis of the lottery is to compute expected values or average values and say, if we play this game a long time, how much per ticket are we likely to win or lose? Um, and on average, in this game I just showed you, this sort of toy version of the lottery, you would expect to lose about 50 cents per play. So I said this was sort of not a very realistic lottery. And actually, one respect in which it was, it's not realistic, is that it's actually incredibly generous to the player compared to a real lottery. So um, what you're looking at here is the payoffs from an actual Massachusetts lottery game um, from around 2005. I don't remember the exact date. Um, 
Here's how this looks. I'm sure you memorized, I'm sure you counted how many balls there were in the cage in the very first slide. But in case you didn't, uh, there was 48 balls. Um, when the cage spins, you pull out six of them. And of course, you at home pick your six numbers and try to match as many as you can of the ones that come out of the cage. So if you match all six, that's great. You win the jackpot. And that's some incredibly large number, all the money that's in the jackpot pool. But the chance of that happening is very low, about 1 in 9.3 million. Um, so, um, but of course, that very rarely happens. And you want people to want to play. You want people to feel that they have a chance to win something. And so a real jackpot has all these lower tier prizes, right? If you match 5 out of 6, that's still a very handsome prize of $4,000. If you match 4 out of 6, now that's starting to be not so unlikely, right? 1 in 800 times. If you buy 10 tickets a day, you're probably going to see that happen from time to time. Um, and you win 150 bucks. That sort of feels pretty good. Um, actually, one clever thing about this game I like is that if you match 2 out of the 6, they don't give you $2. They just give you another ticket. So you can keep playing. That's very clever. Um, anyway, when you add all this up, um, you can figure out that, for example, uh, the one, let's say the jackpot is $1 million. The one million, you're going to win only about one every 10 million times. So probably people really don't play that long. But if you did, if you mean in math, we like to sort of like extrapolate things out to infinity. If you played 10 million times, you would win $1 million on average, uh, which is about 10 cents a play. Not very much. And if you actually add up the values of all these prizes, you get a truly measly number, just under 80 cents of expected value. Uh, for your $2 ticket. So that's much worse than the baby game I, sh I showed you. And most state lotteries look something like this. So here's the thing. Um, in the time period I'm showing you, Massachusetts had a problem with its lottery. And the problem was that people were not playing it. Um, <laughs> and it's probably not because people, like, made a complicated table like this. It's more psychological than that. Running a state lottery is, in some sense, an exercise in a, both applied math and applied psychology. What happened was that nobody won the jackpot for a long time. And um, you know the jackpot pool just kind of piled up and up, more and more money in it. And in one sense, that makes the lottery more enticing when the jackpot is very large. But people start to get a little dispirited. And people start to feel like they're not going to win. And people stop playing. And when, people, when fewer people are playing, it's even less likely that somebody will hit the jackpot. And you can see that there's sort of like a downward death spiral of this, uh, of this lottery. So the people at the Massachusetts Lottery had an idea. They, they, they borrowed an idea from, uh, from a game in Michigan, which was also called Windfall, um, a recently discontinued game, um, called the Roll Down. This is how the Roll Down worked. Um, they said, well, if nobody wins the jackpot, we don't want it to just keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger and nobody wins it. Let's say if it goes over a certain threshold, it was two million that they picked. If it goes over $2 million, if that week nobody wins the jackpot, we're not just going to let the money pile into the pot. We're going to roll that money down. We're going to take that money and put it into all the lower prizes and make them, work and make them worth more. So we're not going to have this thing where nobody, where nobody wins. That money is going to get paid out. So their goal um, was to have a lottery system that was more enticing, uh, that seemed to the players like a better deal. Um, and they did a good job. And they did get a lot more people to play. Um, in fact, um, they sort of did too good of a job. <laughs> it's always the great accomplishment of my life if I can get a laugh with a table. That's, <laughs> as a mathematician, that's what you really want. So what you're looking at here. Uh, is the payoff for cash windfall on February 7th, 2005, which was the first roll down drawing on the new game. So if you compare this, I mean, it's quite startling, right? This hitting four out of six, which before was worth $400, on this day, because nobody won the jackpot, was worth almost $2,400. Um, hitting three out of six, I forgot how much that was worth before, which is a mere $5 prize before, was now a $6 prize. And that's something that is $60 prize. People are paying attention. That's good. And this is something that it is really not at all unlikely. So in this case, the expected value of a $2 ticket, even though you're not going to win the jackpot, is actually $5.53. So that is a pretty good deal. 
by the way, you might ask, um, why do I happen to know the exact payoffs for February 7th, 2005, of all days? Well, the reason I know it um, is because I read it in this document. You're not really supposed to be able to read this from where you're sitting. Um, but what you are looking at is a letter uh, from the Inspector General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to the State Treasurer of Massachusetts. This is the first page of a 25-page PDF document, um, which is trying to explain what had happened to the Massachusetts State Lottery. <laughs> and it's a very interesting story. I will, I, in fact, I, I would venture to say that this is the only municipal fiscal oversight document you will ever read that makes you wonder if somebody has the movie rights to it. <laughs> um, so the reason I know that February, the exact payoffs on February 7th, 20, 20, 2005, the first day of the, uh, uh, the first roll down of the new game, uh, was that on that day, um, the state lottery got a call uh, from a cashier at a star market in Cambridge, Massachusetts, sort of saying like, so some college kids just came in and bought $5,000 of lottery tickets. Is that strange? Like, should we allow that? Cashiers are supposed to call in if there's sort of an unexpectedly large lottery purchase. Um, so what had happened? Let me back up a little bit. So um, as it happened, uh, in January of 2005, which is sort of the inter-semester period, uh, at MIT they have um, a tradition of having sort of short-term three-week independent studies in between the semester. Um, and a student named Brian Harvey, who was a senior at MIT at the time, he had what in retrospect is now seen to be the incredible good luck of doing an independent study about the expected value of state lotteries. <laughs> so we can presume that he made a table pretty much like the one I just showed you. And as you can imagine, the next thing he did was sort of like go around to everybody in his dorm and say like, if it's okay, you should really give me like all the money you have right now so I can go to the star market uh, and buy lottery tickets. Uh, and, and that is exactly what you did. And this group of people um, did indeed about triple their money on that first drawing. Um, they, they called themselves random strategies. Um, that was the name of their that was the name of their group. Um, actually, interestingly enough, you may say this is sort of how very not random what they chose to do, but, um, but random was the name of their dorm, <laughs> MIT being MIT. They all lived in a place called Random Hall. Um, <laughs> actually, and by the way, let me just tell a little more of the story. Um, that was not the only high volume purchase of lottery tickets on that day. So there was also, uh, a huge purchase uh, in a drugstore in Quincy, Massachusetts on the South Shore, um, which turned out to be from a large group of biomedical scientists at Northeastern who were known as the, who were known as the Dr. Jong Lottery Club. I feel like that's the best name <laughs> that anyone had. And there was also um, a big purchase in Williamsburg, Massachusetts. Um, and that purchase uh, was made by Jerry Selby, who was a retired engineer from Michigan. And now, for listening comprehension, who remembers why else I have mentioned Michigan in this talk? <laughs> exactly. So Jerry Selby was a guy who, for many years, had been making a lot of money playing Michigan windfall <laughs> until Michigan closed down that game. And he absolutely could not believe his eyes when he saw that a year later, <laughs> Massachusetts opened the same game. So if you look on your map, you will see that Williamsburg, which is in the northwest corner of the state, is in fact the geographically closest point in Massachusetts to the state of Michigan. So he immediately drove there to listen, until he crossed the border and got to the first convenience store uh, he could find, and he started buying tickets. So um, the whole story has like many amazing twists and turns. And uh, let's just say, that, I mean, because this kept on happening and the lottery kept on rolling down and this group of people kept on buying tickets with the money they made, they sort of, you know, you roll your investments back into your plan and you buy more tickets um, until it, it came to the point where on a given roll down day, um, 
approximately 80% of all tickets sold to anyone in the state of Massachusetts in this game were being sold to either Random Strategies, the Dr. John Lottery Club, or Jerry Selby. <laughs> um, so, this is, so this is what happened. Um, and how does the story end? It's like a bit anticlimactic, but here what you're seeing is uh, the front page story of the Boston Globe uh, from July 31st. 2011, um, and this is when the Globe ran the story of like that something had gone awry with Massachusetts cash windfall. That this game was essentially uh, being used as a piggy bank by uh, a very large, by several groups of high volume bettors. And at this point, the game is up. Once this story comes out, because you, uh, as I said, lotteries are about math, but they're also about psychology. So when people felt that the game was rigged. Then people stopped playing, and then the money dries up, right? Then it doesn't work anymore. So in some sense, I've told you the whole story. But if you look at the story from a mathematical lens, I mean, when you read a story like this, you start to sort of have some puzzles. And it's really those puzzles that I want to talk about tonight. Um, there's two, one easy, one hard. Let's start with the easy one. Um, the, the first puzzle is, how could you actually get away with this? I mean, may I remind you that the state knows who wins the lottery, because they have to give you the money, <laughs> right? It's not a secret. So the state certainly knew that the winning tickets were being sold in a measure of 80% to the same three convenience stores. <laughs> um, so you have to wonder, like, how could no one catch on uh, to what was happening. And, and, um, and this, this one is easy. Uh, the answer is that the state totally figured it out and totally knew what was going on. In fact, now I'll sort of uh, pull aside the curtain a bit. I told you that the first thing that Brian Harvey did uh, when he realized the structure of cash windfall and this loophole that allowed it to be used as a piggy bank, I told you that the first thing he did was go and round up all of his friends, take all their money, and go buy lottery tickets. But that was actually the second thing he did. Um, the first thing he did, being the kind of like good, honest young man who goes to MIT, um, was he took the tea out to Braintree, Massachusetts, where the state lottery headquarters was, and he sort of like went in, um, and he sh showed them his table, like something like this, and he said, like, I'm planning to buy as many lottery tickets as I can afford this week and make a lot of money. Is that legal? And the Inspector General's report does not record what he was told, but it must have been something like, sure, go knock yourself out, because, because we know what happened. We know that he bought tickets and kept on buying tickets. And by the way, I didn't emphasize this, but if you looked at the date on that news story, that was 2011. OK, so six years. <laughs> um, OK, so that's in some sense the answer to the puzzle, but it instantly spawns a sub-puzzle, which is, why did the state not care that this was happening? OK, I shall explain. Um, so here's how, here's my, this is now you're seeing the limit of my PowerPoint skills. <laughs> um, so here's a diagram of what happens in this lottery game. Um, in a lottery, um, the state is going to take $2 from every ticket, OK? And when it takes that $2, $1 $1.20 goes back into the prize pool, and 80, per, and 80 cents is taken as revenue, right? To like build roads, and pay school teachers, and put up street lights, and all the things the state revenue does. So for the, 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 sort of, uh, the value proposition for the state is actually incredibly simple, 80 cents of revenue per ticket. That's it. No more computation needs to be done. What that means is that the state doesn't care who wins. That is absolutely irrelevant. The state cares about one thing and one thing only, and that is how many tickets are sold. And these guys were buying a lot of tickets. So I think this is something that when the story was initially reported, um, it was being reported as if these guys had somehow were stealing money, or maybe not quite stealing, but sort of somehow funneling money from the state. But the Inspector General reports that actually over the life of this scheme, the state actually came out almost $10 million ahead of where they would have been without 
these high volume betters. So, and, and it ends in sort of a state of confusion because it, it is sort of hard to claim that you got scammed if you made $10 million. <laughs> Maybe Trump could do it, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, this diagram should show you um, if the money wasn't coming from the state, where was it coming from? And the answer, of course, is that it was coming from the other people who were playing the lottery. Because remember, these guys were only playing on the roll down day, only when the table looked like the good table I showed you, not when they looked like the bad table I showed you. But everybody else in Massachusetts was playing every day, just like people do when they play the lottery. And so um, the way to think of it is that this was basically a big cash transfer um, from uh, regular lottery players to random strategies and the other high volume betters, um, with Massachusetts taking 80 cents each time it went by. So from this point of view, you can see why Massachusetts did not halt this practice, because Massachusetts was making bank from this practice. In fact, I think the right way to think of it, you know, a lot of people maybe influenced by this sort of similar story about MIT kids who were like winning a blackjack, sort of said these guys figured out a way to beat the house. And what I want to say is that that metaphor is completely wrong because what random strategists were doing was they were making a huge number of bets, each one of which has positive expected value. So maybe sometimes they were going to win, sometimes they were going to lose, but because the bets were weighted towards them, if they made a lot of bets in the long run, they were going to come out of the house. They were going to come out ahead. And if that is your model, you are not beating the house. You are the house. <laughs> and that, I think, in the end, is the right quantitative way to see what was going on here. That random strategies had, in some sense, created a kind of virtual casino, which was them, at which the other players would play. And what was the state? Well, the state was the state. So it sort of looks a lot like this, right? <laughs> I mean, they're at the casino. People happily line up to kind of sort of lose money at a fairly steady rate, occasionally win, but mostly lose. Um, and each time that happens, Nevada kind of comes in and reaches in its hand and takes a little bit of the money. <laughs> oh no, what happened? I need a tech guy to come save me. If I get canceled, will it go back to the way it was? Did that guy leave? Yay, okay. I mean, if I had canceled, I, mean, I could have just canceled the entire talk. I didn't know what was going to happen. Okay. Okay. So, um, right. So Massachusetts had no more incentive to shut down random strategies than Nevada has to shut down all the casinos in Las Vegas. It would make no sense for them to do that. Um, so that's one puzzle solved. But I want to kind of talk about a slightly deeper one. Um, so I've sort of been presenting. Um, this story with all three of these groups the same. But they were not the same. There was one difference. Um, the Dr. Jong Lottery Club and Jerry Selby used what was called the quick pick machine. You guys know what the quick pick is? How many of you? Got a lot of liars here tonight. Okay. Um, okay, the quick pick machine is that when you buy a lot of lottery tickets, you just have the machine spit out random numbers. Because you know it doesn't really matter what numbers you have. The, the machine doesn't, you know, the, the balls in the cage don't actually know like what your birthday is or like what your cat's birthday is or anything like that. Their numbers are random. And so it doesn't really matter what numbers you get. So to save time, you just um, have the computer pick numbers for you. Um, and if you're buying 200,000 tickets, as random strategies were doing at the high point of their scheme, it would definitely save you a lot of time to use the quick pick. But they did not do this. <laughs> they had their 200,000 tickets that they liked. Uh, they were filled out by hand, and those are the ones that they used. This I found extremely puzzling. It's mentioned in the Inspector General's report, but they don't sort of comment on how strange it is. Maybe I'll just take, I'm doing well with time, so let me just, as a little excursus, this is like for the kids to give good life advice. This may sound like awesome, like wow, like you can just like play the lottery and like make money if you sort of happen to be smart and see a loophole. Okay, so first of all, there's a lot of extremely boring work involved if you actually sort of read about what these guys did. Filling out 200,000 lottery tickets by hand, extremely boring. <laughs> even, if you, even if you don't do that, uh, it turns out that if your income for the year is, uh, is made of 
lottery tickets, you have to fill out a tax form for like each win and loss to like verify that you, uh, <laughs> you know, your net income. So this is like incredibly time consuming and you have to save them all in case you get audited. And if your main source of income is lottery tickets, you do get audited. <laughs> so, so I, so I talked to Jerry Selby, who was sort of the, I mean, he had been doing it, remember, for like six years in Michigan and then N years in, in, in Massachusetts. He actually had to build a barn behind his house uh, <laughs> in order to hold his hundreds of plastic tubs of used losing lottery tickets. Um, and altogether, these guys in Random Strategies, um, they made three and a half million dollars, which sounds awesome, but that took six years and there was 10 people. Now ask yourself if you graduated from MIT and you just like went and got a job. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm just saying, kids, like I don't recommend this as like, your life plan. I think, I mean, I think they probably could have made more money and somehow maybe did something more fulfilling. But for some people, the joy of beating the system is its own reward, right? So I think that's the way, uh, that's the way to see it. Okay, that's like I had to top step away from mathematics and give like a life lessons interlude. Um, so anyway, the question is, why would you fill out the tickets by hand? Um, so in math, Again, when we're trying to understand the problem, let's try to make it simpler and hope that we don't uh, and hope that we don't lose the main features of what we're trying to study. So what you're looking at here is a game, for some reason, people often call it the Transylvanian Lottery. Um, and it's much simpler than the real lottery, because instead of 48 numbers, there's only seven. Um, and the cage, instead of giving you six balls with numbers on them, it only gives you three. And what I like about this is that it's simple enough that I can literally write down all of the possible jackpots on a single slide, all the way of choosing three numbers out of seven, which for the combinatorics fan is a number called seven choose three, uh, which is 35. And, um, and I encourage you to sort of check whether you believe that I've got them all. Um, so let's imagine that you are a high volume better in this game. But in this game, there's only 35 tickets, so it's sort of, I mean, a high volume better is maybe not that high. Let's say for us, a high volume better is somebody who buys seven of these tickets. Okay, that's pretty much, that's like one fifth of all possible tickets. Um, and the question is, how should you do this? Um, well, first of all, I gotta tell you what the rules are of this lottery. So again, let's make this simpler. We can't have like that many tiers of prizes when there's only three numbers. Um, I'm just gonna, sorry, I'm just gonna quickly, when, when we have that little glitch, it changed my view, and I wanna see it. Um, sorry, let me just bring this back to where you were. I like this view better. Okay, so in this lottery, there's only three things that can happen. If you hit the jackpot, that's great, you win $6. If you get two out of three, so let's, if the, if, the, if the jackpot was 137 and you have 127, you get a smaller prize called a deuce. You only win $2. And if you only get one out of the three or zero out of the three, you get nothing. Okay, so this sort of mimics the features of a real lottery. The more, uh, the more numbers you get right, the more, money, uh, the more money you win. So what I want to look at is what would happen if you played this game with a quick pick. So you're, again, you're a big better. And you get, um, oh, I didn't expect that to happen. Okay. Okay. Um, so what happens is something like this. Um, as you can imagine, I mean, you might get very lucky and win a lot of money. You might win very little money if you're unlucky. There's kind of a spread, a nice sort of smooth curve. Um, and you can check that your expected winnings in this game is $6. On average, you're going to get 2.4 of these deuces. That's $4.80. And you're going to get 0 0.2 jackpots. That you can actually check, by the way, right? Because you have one-fifth of the tickets. So the chance that you have the jackpot is one in five. So about every, time, every five times, uh, you're gonna hit the jackpot. 
So let's do this, because I think I've got plenty of time. We're going to kind of actually play this game a little bit. Now, if you, um, sometimes when I have like a smaller room and people are at desks, we do this as, in an interactive way. I think we could actually, I, there's so many kids here that I sort of want to do it. Is that OK? OK, let's do it. It's decided. I heard some rando guy yell yes, and I've decided that's my cue. Um, OK, so what you're going to do, and I'm going to use this time to try to get my view that I like back, by the way. Um, I have picked seven tickets that I like. Why don't you guys pick seven tickets that you like? But before you do, I'm going to tell you the rules of the game. Um, this is going to be an elimination game. Uh, the rules of the game are that somebody, one of you guys, whoever feels the most random, is going to pick random numbers for us. Um, if, if you win $6 or more, you get to stay in. And if you win less than $6, you're out. Well, that seems fair, right? Because we saw that the expected value of this game is $6. So probably some of you guys are going to get more. Some of you guys are going to get less. We'll play a few rounds and see who stays in, OK? So if you are here, especially if you're a kid, if you, maybe if you can memorize seven tickets, that's great. But maybe if you have like a piece of paper or something to jot something down, um, write down write down seven tickets. Choose ones that you like. Um, And I'll give you guys a minute to pick out ones that you like. I mean, as a thought, by the way, while you're doing this, you might want to kind of think about a bad strategy would be to pick seven copies of the same ticket. You could do that. But that would be bad for this game, because then it's very feast or famine, right? You might get seven jackpots, but very likely you're going to get nothing and be out. So that's something to think about in terms of um, OK, now while people are finishing up, I need somebody who the very important job Maybe Brian will do it. Brian, will you be my ball cage and like sort of randomly yell out numbers? Do you feel random enough to do it? I'm talking to you. OK. OK, so have, have people got their, uh, yes, Ravi? That was not the reason. Um, OK, I have, I've, I've, have, se have several people got their tickets? All right, let's do it. OK, uh, Brian, Brian is going to, oh, and let me emphasize, order doesn't count in case this wasn't clear. Order does not count. doesn't matter what order the numbers are in. OK, so now Brian Conray, director of the American Institute of Mathematics. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've given him a mathematically menial task to do. Uh, you're going to yell out three numbers between one and seven. Three, five, four. Okay, three, five, four. Otherwise known as three, four, five. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see how we do. Now I'll put up, so everybody's counting. I'll put up mine, and we'll see how I did. Um, okay, so I, first I'll check if I have the jackpot, but I don't. I don't have three, four, five. Um, I have one, four, five, so I get two dollars for that, right? I have, um, I have three, four, six. And I, have, and I have three, five, seven. I get $2 for that. So I've got six. I'm still alive. OK, everybody, everybody three, four, five. <coughs> Are people confused? What's the question? What? Oh, so $6 for a jackpot, $2 if you get two out of three. So I, had, I have three of those deuces. I have three tickets that won two out of three, the 145, the 346, and the 357. 
Are you guys adding up your winnings? Who's got a lot? Anybody get like 10 or 12? A lot. Okay. I want to know who got the most. Anybody got 14? Okay, no, I don't see any. So I got some 12s. Was that the top score? Who got 12? Okay, a small set of people, like pretty good, but I definitely saw a good amount of 10s and 12s. Um, who's out? Who got totally hosed on this one and got less than six? Okay, a good number of people, but who's still in? Okay, good. Let's do it again. But remember, if you're out, you're out. Okay, this is elimination. Okay, Brian, if... One, two, five. Let's look. Okay. Um, I am once again jackpotless, but, um, but I have one, two, three. That's two. And one, four, five. That's, so two. I have that again. That's good. Let's uh, one, two, five. And I have two, five, six. So I'm up to six. So I'm in the clear. And then, um, and then I'm out. So I've got six again. Okay. Um, who's still in? Okay, that's a thinner group, but a lot of people are still in. Okay, let's do it again, Brian. 247. Two, ah, I've got jackpot. Okay, so I've, I already see it. I've already got six, but nonetheless, I'm going to see how much more I want. Let's see. 247. Uh, 25. Uh, and that's it. I got nothing else. Okay, now who's still in? Okay, still small group. Let's do, let's do one more, Ryan. What do you say? Want to do one more? And then I'll be it? Three, five, six. Okay, three, five, six. Okay, I'm jackpotless. Three, five, six. I have two, five, six. Oh, look, I'm saved at the end because I have two, five, six. Three, four, six. I've got two of those. And then three, five, seven. So I'm still in. Okay, who else is still in? Okay. All right, this is good. About like, it looks like maybe like 15 people around the room. Okay, we could keep doing this. Um, but then you wouldn't even. <laughs> okay, so there's always one guy who doesn't want to hear the end of my talk. <laughs> I was like, this just got good. Let's just do this. It's like, okay. <laughs> I think I, for, for those who want to keep playing, I think I have explained the rules well enough that you can play at home. Um, okay, so. Uh, what did you, just out of curiosity, what did you guys notice about my awesome numbers? Yeah, so, I, so, so it's not that I'm guaranteed a jackpot, right? Because lots of times I didn't get a jackpot. But somebody back there said, I get $6 each time. And you might have noticed that I got $6 every time. You know, one thing about games is you should definitely, it's good to decide your strategy first and then set the rules. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a basic principle of game playing, and that's exactly what I did. So my, my set of cards has a very special feature, which is that its payoff matrix, as many of you observed, uh, looks very different from what you get with a quick pick. So my set of cards, has the set of tickets, has the property that no matter what the jackpot is, I will win $6. Never more, never less. So this is that rare case where the expected value is indeed exactly the value that I expect. I will always get $6 with my cards every time. Now you might ask, why is this good? Why would I want to do this? Besides that I made up this cockamamie rule that was exactly designed to privilege my set of tickets. Well, in life, right, if, you're, if you think of yourself as an investor, and this game is a kind of investment for the people playing it, um, Usually when you're investing, if you can get the same return with less risk, you're happy, right? If you can get the same, on average, amount of profits, but not risk mo losing money, um, that's very good. And that's especially true if you're in what's called leverage, right? If you've borrowed the money that you're playing with. So again, step with me back to 2005. If you have asked all the kids in your dorm for a lot of money until you have $5,000 and then you buy lottery tickets with it and you lose. And then you go back to all your friends and say, well, according to my calculations, in the long run, if you keep on giving me more of your money, we'll eventually win. <laughs> Even at MIT, that is a very tough sell. 
So you do, ideally, you want to build a strategy, what's called in finance, a hedge, um, that somehow keeps all your return uh, without having any risk. Um, and I think the reason that they were so careful about their tickets um, was something very much like this. So let me say, I, I want to say a little bit about, about how did I come up with this crazy set of tickets. Um, let me draw, show you a picture of it. Um, this is a diagram of my tickets. And um, well, you can sort of see that this diagram has seven lines on it. Well, one of the lines looks like a circle, but I'm going to call it a line. Each of these lines have, has three points on it. And the three points on a line are my tickets, right? You see one, two, three along the bottom, one, six, seven along the side. That circle is two, five, six, which is one of my tickets. Um, this is a beautiful object of geometry called the Fano plane. And um, the thing I want to say to you tonight about it, um, I mean, I think you may have the right to object when I call that circle a line. Why? Because the circle is not a line. OK, that's a pretty solid objection. Nonetheless, I'm going to tell you that it is a line. Um, and the reason is that it because in mathematics, at least mathematics, the way we do it in 2016, and maybe even the way we've did it, done it uh, you know, since about the late 19th century, um, is that we don't really like to say like what a line is. We like to say, what is a line defined to be? And the way we approach it is we say, well, a line is the kind of thing that behaves the way a line is supposed to behave. And how do we know how lines are supposed to behave? Well, Euclid told us so, right? We know we took geometry. We know the rules for lines. So let me sort of put a little slogan underneath this picture. What's our sort of acid test for whether these are lines? Well, should they, they should obey Euclid's axioms, that every two lines intersect in a single point, and every two points are contained in a single line. And it's kind of fun to do this. You can sort of look and see that that's true. If I pick uh, two points, like one and five, OK, there's the line, one, four, five. Um, if I pick two points, four and six, OK, there's the line, like three, four, six. I've drawn the line through them. Two and five, OK, the line between them is the circle. And it's sort of fun to like, sort of let your eyes roam over this diagram and see that it, um, that it actually obeys these rules. By the way, so if there are people in the audience who are actually like, taking high school geometry right now or like, recently did, yes, OK. So there's something I sort of slightly lied because I said, OK, the lines and the points behave the way that Euclid told you they're supposed to behave. But there's something actually different about this, that it's not the same as Euclid's axiom. Does anybody see it? OK, what? Ah, so that is a mere cosmetic artifact of the fact that I've had to project this onto a two-dimensional screen for you. But really, the only points in this diagram are where the numbers are. So it may look to you like there's an intersect. Well, oh, I get to use my laser. OK, I'm going to use it. Um, it may look to you like there's an intersection there, but that is only an illusion. <laughs> because that's not a point. OK, so that's a good objection, but it's not the objection I have in mind. I'm saying that these rules are actually not Euclid's rules in one minor respect. <laughs> that, that's my job, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the difference is merely this, that in Euclidean geometry, not every two lines intersect in a single point. Two lines can also be parallel. And that, I think, all right-thinking people see as a defect in Euclidean geometry. It stinks when rules have exceptions. They shouldn't have exceptions. This is what's called a projective geometry, which is much nicer, where it's very simple. Like any two distinct lines intersect in a single point. There's no exception for parallel lines. So in this kind of geometry, uh, no lines are parallel. And if we had like another hour together, I would tell you a whole beautiful long story about the development of perspective painting in 16th century Italy, where they sort of understood that when you look at like a road from like far away, like the two edges of the road, even though they're parallel in the three-dimensional world, like seem to meet at a single point called the vanishing point. And it's exactly because they were sort of instinctively learning how to do projective geometry like on a flat canvas. Another time, I'll come back and we'll talk about that. Um, the point I want to make is that somehow this abstract discussion we're having about the rules of Euclidean geometry are exactly what make this set of tickets have the property that I want it to have. Because if you remember, um, 
when my, my menial slave, Brian Conray, like yelled out uh, the numbers one, two, five, um, how did I know I was going to get exactly $6? Well, because I know there's a line through one and two, so I had a ticket that had those two. There's my $2. I know there's a line through two and five, so I have a ticket that has two and five, and there's two more dollars. And there's a line that has one and five, and so I have a ticket that has those two dollars. Of course, the other option is that when Brian picks three points that are actually on a line, then I win the jackpot and I win nothing else. But either way, I win exactly six. So it's exactly the sort of geometric feature of, um, of these points that make it have this magical property. Now, we've gotten a bit away from the actual situation of cash windfall. So I have to say, like, once I understood sort of what they were trying to do, I became obsessed with trying to figure out what configuration of actual lottery tickets in cash windfall they might have used. This is an example of an object in math called a combinatorial design. And so I just like sort of went hunting through the literature on combinatorial designs. And eventually, um, after a lot of work and a lot of digging through references, um, I found the following, a paper of RHF Denniston from 1976, which exactly gives you a configuration of about 200,000 tickets, which you, you can't quite guarantee you're going to win a lot of those very valuable five out of six prizes, but you can almost guarantee it. You can guarantee that you have like a 98% chance of getting at least five of those five out of six prizes if you buy these particular 200,000 tickets. And if you bought a random 200,000 tickets, you would take a substantially larger risk um, of losing money. And just to show you how far mathematics can come, I have to sort of show you a, uh, a very interesting comment that Deniston writes uh, in his paper, just, just to sort of show how far the culture of mathematics has come. He's clearly quite embarrassed <laughs> that he used a computer in order to sort of like, he's a, he sort of seems to be like, oh, a real mathematician would have worked this all out with a pencil. <laughs> And so he, so he, so he makes it clear um, that, OK, like, yes, I checked it on a computer, but I certainly didn't use a computer to figure it out. That was on me. <laughs> we don't really have that attitude anymore. I think nowadays, in any kind of large-scale operation like this, the computer is seen as our partner, and there's no shame uh, in using a computer to help us discover. So well, OK, I've left one question unanswered. I have now uh, I've shown you what they could have been doing. Is that what they actually did? Um, I wish I could tell you that I knew. I never was really able to get these folks to talk to me directly <laughs> about, what, about what they did. I think they're happy to have that chapter of their life uh, behind them. Um, so I'll just say this. I, I, I was able to get them to say roughly this sort of some version of this risk minimizing strategy was what they had in mind, but I wasn't able to sort of get them to uh, speak up to the actual configuration they use. So I'll only say this. Um, I don't know if they used this, uh, this paper I found, but if they didn't, I think they should have. <laughs> um, so I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Please line up in front of these two microphones. Uh, there is one on this side and one on the other side so that they can pick up. Um, any questions for Jordan? Uh, can you walk, uh, walk, walk to one of the microphones, please? No? I have a quick question, which is, uh, you know, about your thing about the what they actually did. I mean, do you know the amounts of money that they won and how many times and so forth? Because obviously knowing that they won a relatively even amount of money each time would tell you that maybe they were um, trying to guarantee that. So I, I, I know the total amount, but I don't know the sort of week by week, which is what I would have to know for that. In some sense, know, knowing the total amount they won over the, over the six years is kind of like knowing the expected value. And it, it's whether or not they were sort of like, winning and losing big week to week. My expectation is that they were not. My expectation was at least the random strategies guy had like hedged that risk away. But I don't have any direct way of, uh, of looking at their ledgers and knowing that. Other questions? Here's one over here. 
I, I just read, and I can't remember where, but there are these people around the world that have won the jackpot like three or four times over the course of their, have, did you read that article? I don't know if it was in Time, or I don't know where I read it, but mm -hmm. it's a group of people, and it's five to six of them that have won the big, huge lottery jackpots multiple times, more than twice. Any, um, I don't know, I mean, is that just completely random that these single people have it could be i mean i think what they, i think with stuff like this it's always sort of fun to think about let me put it this way if somebody like won powerball like three times you'd be sure to hear about it right so most people are not going to but you have to ask yourself out of all the people in the world who play and now in your story you're saying they won lotteries in different places so you sort of have to say out of all the people in the world who play all the lotteries would you expect someone or some two people or some five people to have won multiple times. Um, thinking that just the way news spreads, news of the unusual spreads more rapidly than news of the usual. Like you wouldn't have read a story like Time Magazine, some schmuck lost again. <laughs> like, I mean. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think it's really a matter of like the individual case. You sort of have to sort of say like, how unlikely is it that someone somewhere in the world would have this happen to them and then that I would hear about? So in some cases, you still can be quite amazed. And in other cases, uh, you realize that it's not so unlikely after all. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, my question is, since the, the table was uh, published in advance, I assume, mm -hmm. and the three major bettors knew what that was going to be, um, one could imagine that if they bet enough, that the, uh, the state would lose money on that date and then have to recoup it later. Is that something that happened regularly, or uh, do, you, do you know? No, and it can't happen by design, because the state is always putting a certain amount of money. I mean, I mean the, the state is just the only amount of money that goes into the prize pool is that, uh, so okay, so let me explain. Then you may say like, wait, if everybody who got those five numbers got $40,000, so that's not the way it works. In any, lo in any lottery, if a bunch of people hit the same number, they have to share the winnings. Oh, I see. So what happened is, I mean, I didn't really go into it in the talk, but it was not always tripling your money. That was at the very beginning. But what happened is the more these guys bet, the more ticket splitting there was, and the more the profit went down. So for most of the time they were doing this, their profit was running about at 15%. So that also explains why were there no more than three groups, because they were sort of in an equilibrium where another big group joining would have meant that everybody would have lost money. So they sort of found an equilibrium and sort of stayed there. I see. If, so um, so the, the expected value actually was dependent upon how, much, how many tickets were purchased. For, for, the, for the players, yes. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Yeah, you kind of just answered my question, but um, I was wondering how did it go on for seven years? Like, it seems like eventually, <clears throat> you know, the, the expected value would be like $2.01, right? Because more people would keep, like, did they have some agreement to maintain this 15% premium or like, you know, like well, in I a think free this market, is the, right? It seems like it would go to zero. So, so I mean, I think uh, this is like sort of the, in some sense, this is like what the basic question of economics, if you're like a true believer in classical economics, you know, you're like, oh, is that a $20 bill on the ground? Like, no, it can't be because someone would have picked it up, right? I mean, <laughs> right, so in, in some, in somehow, in theory, profits will eventually go to zero because if you can buy more, I mean, but that, does, that doesn't happen in real life. I don't think it's because there was an explicit agreement, but I think somehow that often happens in real markets that, I mean, like in real markets, like companies do make substantial profits even without explicit collusion. My, my sense is, um, you know, I don't have any way to verify with me, but Selby told me that the random strategies people had approached him about sort of maybe taking turns and alternating that he didn't want to do it. He felt like, I mean, with it, it's very interesting. There's lots of interesting ethical questions about what they were doing. So he felt like, now that's not fair. I don't really, uh, <laughs> I don't really know exactly how the line is drawn, but that he was clearly like, <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I, it, it's an interesting question, I mean, about markets, like sort of how they arrived at that particular equilibrium, but that was where they sat for a while. A question on the other side? 
So I don't understand why the state of Massachusetts didn't take a further advantage of the tickets. Like why they themselves didn't immediately participate in the lottery or at least raise the, <laughs> <laughs> raise the, raise the ticket price and make a larger revenue because if the winnings were $5.53, couldn't they have raised the ticket price to like $4 and still get people to play? So that's a great question. And again, I feel like this whole thing, if I were like an economist instead of a mathematician, this whole thing would be about like the failure of what they teach you in Ec 101 to actually be true. Um, <laughs> so here's what would happen. I mean, people decide whether to buy things Yes, in part, based on whether they think the value of the thing is worth more than they paid for it, as they'll tell you in, in classical economics. But probably more than that, they decide based on whether they think the price is fair. So without even being a professional economist, I can tell you what would happen if after lottery tickets costing $2 for 20 years, the, um, the, ma the state lottery said, OK, from now on, lottery tickets are $4. People would like burn down the lottery office, and, uh, <laughs> and nobody would buy lottery tickets. Because people would feel like, that's not fair. Lottery tickets cost $2. I mean, I think I think that's what I think that's actually the answer. I think that's what happened. That they, they, that in that business, that you sort of you can't do sudden price hikes because people will get angry and not, or not buy. Or if the state of Massachusetts only cared about the amount of s tickets it sold, why didn't it do like a better scheme than Michigan so that the they get even more than the amount they get, like a really really good scheme that would get even more tickets? So your question actually speaks to. An interesting one was, was that I don't even really know how much Massachusetts knew about what had happened in Michigan. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say, this is where you see that I'm a math professor and not a real journalist, because I, I tried to like penetrate the sort of public relations wall of both the Massachusetts lottery and the Michigan lottery, and I got nowhere. So uh, the Michigan lottery would not confirm that they knew that Jerry Selby had been making like millions of dollars in their lottery, even though obviously they knew, but they would not tell me that. Um, the Massachusetts lottery would not tell me whether they did this on purpose or not. And, I, and there I actually truly don't know. I don't know if they just like read about it and thought it was a cool idea and didn't sort of anticipate what would happen. Once it started happening, they knew for sure, but I'm not sure they planned it. And I, and I can't figure out how to figure it out. If, any, if there's any real journalists who know how I should have pursued this in the room, like, please tell me. So, hmm. I have two. Okay. The first one, how many tickets does a Michigan, Michigan guy really buy in that um, corner store? So I don't know the exact number. I think he was comparable to the Random Strategies guys, so I think he may, maybe he and his, he had family members too, were doing like a sort of 200K ticket buy. And... Who actually won that lottery on that day? On that particular day, um, I know that the random strategies folks about tripled their money. I don't, because it's not recorded in the Inspector General's report, I don't know exactly how much the other groups won. Um, I, but I know that the random strategies guy, I think, took away about 15,000 on their 5,000 of bets. Okay, let's, let's take another question. So. No, yeah, kids are always first. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, did Massachusetts change to a different lottery system at the end, or what? Yeah. So they went back to a more traditional lottery, and of course, what you should do right after you hear this talk is you should like run home and like look up <laughs> the state lotteries <laughs> to see if anyone's running this game. I do this from time to time. Um, <laughs> I think. So the, the Michigan thing really got no publicity. I mean, they shut down their game, but as far as I know, it was, there was never any reporting about Jerry Selby in the context of Michigan. This game, I think, I'm not saying this was like a huge national story or anything, but I think like among people who run state lotteries, they probably all read this story. So I think it probably got enough publicity <laughs> that, um, that, nobody's, that nobody's doing it. There are other, there are other states that, roll, that run roll-down games, but they're, there's a, they're a much less generous roll-down. <laughs> you can close my computer if that's that. Yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, <laughs> to close my computer? You just close it. <laughs> yeah. Not that hard. It's okay. Um, okay. <laughs> this is why I like to use their computer. Okay. Um, yeah, I know. That's why. Let's make 
other uh, question from there. there. Uh, Hi, so uh, I have a question, but first I want to say I read your book while I was hiking Mount Kilimanjaro. I actually wrote you an email about that, and you wrote You're the guy. Back. Yeah, I'm the guy. There's a picture uh, of this guy on my Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so highest your book has ever been, I think that's what we okay, postulated. Yeah. Um, but my question is, uh, so with Fano's plane, you, that works with seven points. Mm -hmm. Can you do a similar trick? Like if you had more numbers than are, exist in the Transylvania lottery, can you do that? So yes, but it's only for very specific numbers that it exists. So th as I said, there's this very beautiful theory of like finite projective geometries um, and combinatorial designs. Uh, and in some sense, this is, this is actually a very active research topic where there was a big breakthrough, not like maybe like two years ago. I don't know, when was Kivash's theorem, theorem ago? Sh showing that in some sense, there are designs that have some of these features um, of every size once the size is big enough. And that was quite, I mean, I think it wasn't surprising that it was true, but we didn't know it was so close to being proved. And that was just, so, I mean, it's an active topic that people are thinking about even today. Okay, let's take one more question. Uh, if there is, or otherwise, let's thank uh, Jordan again. Wait, I have one, one more, more kid. There's one, one more kid. Let's okay, last question. Okay. Last question tonight. <laughs> okay, so you were talking about your diagram and how it covers everything. Is there a faster way to do it without drawing things out? Because when you get into the bigger scale as you'd probably have a lot more lines and it would probably be a lot harder to understand when you look at it. Uh, yes, if you were good at doing like modulo arithmetic, like addition to multiplication, modulo some number. Um, do they teach that in the Palo Alto schools? I never, it's, it's, a, it's sort of, a, they used to do it in the new math back in the old days. <laughs> um, so yes, there are, there are sort of like, uh, there are ways, for instance, that I could have taken those seven points and identified when, with the seven strings of three bits other than zero, zero, zero. And then there would be a sort of a very clear relation telling me like which sets of three I had. And you could do a similar thing for, uh, for larger configurations. And that would be the way in practice if you needed to remember it, uh, you could do it without drawing a picture. Mm. Okay, so let's thank uh, Jordan, Ellen, and the Thank everybody. you guys. Thank you. And thank you everybody. Okay, great.